So originally we were sure to have, a, we were scheduled to have an audience choice of Hong Kong's cultural landscape, but we're running a little bit short on time. So uh, let's move on directly to the panel discussion. So over to you, Montera. Hey, thanks very much to Fredo. Um, perhaps uh, uh, in the interest of, of hearing from the audience, I could suggest that there's quite a number of people who are joining us in Zoom. Um, perhaps you could share um, the question, um, Fredo, and then people could uh, type their answers old fashioned way just in the Zoom chat, and then we can get a sense of audience concern. Okay. Sure. While we wait for Fredo to um, um, launch the question to us, um, perhaps I'll, I'll just um, thank, first of all, all the speakers uh, for sharing um, your insights, uh, both uh, from inside JC Cube and abroad. I mean, I think um, uh, Ken Nicholson set the tone for us by saying uh, somewhat provocatively that Hong Kong is behind the curve um, in, um, in terms of um, preserving uh, cultural landscapes. Then we heard from Michael Morrison uh, from the UK, where we have a very well-established system of um, a, a wide-based um, understanding and concern for landscapes dating back really hundreds of years. Um, and but on the other hand, it's sort of like there's there that has become too much as well. Sort of it's it's become almost unmanageable in, in its complexity. So we we have sort of two two extremes facing us. On the one hand, perhaps too little in place in Hong Kong, and on, on and then if you take it to the logical extreme, then you have um, a, a system that becomes unwieldy. And along the way, uh, Lawrence and David shared with us some examples. Um, of approaches to understanding and managing uh, cultural landscapes. And so what, what I'd like to do in, in the somewhat limited time that we have, we have half an hour for the panel discussion, um, is to, um, to ask two rounds of questions to our speakers, um, ending with uh, Mr. Ben Lowe uh, to have the final word in each round. The first round is, is to consider um, Everyone put forth quite a number of suggestions, but if you had to leave, say, uh, the Hong Kong uh, authorities with uh, one takeaway point, um, when it comes to the issue of um, understanding, um, identifying, and defining uh, cultural landscapes, say in the Hong Kong context, you know, what, what is one key action that needs to happen, um, um, either immediately or, or in the long term? And then in the second round, well, I'll, I'll ask you um, in terms of uh, protecting um, the cultural landscapes, what is one key action that needs to happen? And this goes back to you know, what I guess in the heritage circle is, is very well accepted, but perhaps for the lay audience is, is a bit of a mysterious concept. This, this notion of values-based conservation or values-based management. So the idea not is that, that we're not just um, uh, protecting things that are uh, physical um, and uh, visible, uh, but we're also protecting all the things that Lawrence uh, mentioned when he uh, coined the phrase hidden cultural landscape. All the associations, um, things like astronomical features, et cetera, all of these things which are uh, part and parcel of the, of the landscape as, as it exists, but that perhaps is, is not always either well known or, or well understood um, or, or well protected. So I share with you just um, by way of illustrating this point, um, a couple slides. I think many will have seen this case in the news. This is the Chosun uh, Royal Tombs, uh, one of the sites in South Korea, where of course, uh, anyone who has ever taken his history classes knows that from the Pharaohs onwards, you know, uh, the kings of the past spent a lot of attention planning their tombs. And these are always done, you know, sort of uh, with an eye towards the, the natural landscape and auspicious directions and cardinal points and so forth and connections with features in this case, uh, sacred mountain um, as well. And uh, what, what we have happening now, of course, is this um, very well publicized and, and rather reviled project, which is uh, a, a very large high rise uh, um, um, development which is uh, essentially blocking off um, the view um, of the mountain. And, um, it, you know, from a planning perspective, it's gone through all the EIA procedures. Um, that land is, is zoned um, in, you know, um, um, intensive uh, residential development zone. So there's nothing from a planning perspective that, that is inherently wrong with this project from a procedural point of view. 
On the other hand, you know, from a heritage point of view, uh, we can clearly see that there are impacts that are um, not direct impacts, but, but indirect impacts, in this case, primarily visual. If we take the case that Michael Morrison also um, raised in terms of, say, wind farm projects, here, another, another case uh, from India, in the foreground is a protected um, heritage site. Um, and in, in, in the background, um, in the far distance, is on the ridge of this hill, um, a land, uh, a wind farm project. So on the one hand, yes, the wind farm project is well outside the footprint of the heritage site per se. So again, there's nothing from a heritage um, legislation perspective or a planning perspective, which makes this project um, uh, inappropriate. On the other hand, from a heritage perspective, we could say that there are, you know, impacts, visual impacts, which um, 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 negatively affect the aesthetic values of, of the site as a beautiful landscape. There are biodiversity impacts uh, from the operation of uh, the wind farm. And there are direct impacts, um, including archaeological impacts on so-called um, secondary heritage attributes, things that are maybe not of the first tier or as well um, identified or, or, or well known, but they, they exist in the landscape. Things like ancient farming features, ancient canals, ancient roads, all of these things that are part of Lawrence's so-called hidden cultural landscape. So, so when we take this kind of values-based approach as opposed to a, a kind of just merely a physical um, or a regulatory um, perspective to heritage management um, um, that uh, privileges, you know, built um, heritage or uh, archaeological features that are well known. I come back to our panelists with the question. So perhaps uh, maybe I have Michael Morrison on screen with me. So uh, direct the first round of questions to him first. Um, in terms of identifying, defining, or understanding the cultural landscape in the context of Hong Kong, if you could offer one key policy recommendation for the authorities to take forward, what would that oh, mean? Oh gosh, it's quite a uh, quite a big question, isn't it? I mean, I think um, <clears throat> thinking about uh, things from the sort of um, you know what I was talking about the English perspective, I think that um, if I were begging uh, the Hong Kong system to do one thing, I think I would be asking for an integrated system of control, trying to get um, the, the process of, um, of planning of heritage conservation, of cultural landscape conservation, uh, all under sort of one roof and not have you know, as, as it has emerged over the years in Britain, a whole series of different um, bodies dealing with different things. I think if you could get everybody talking to one another and, you know, developing understanding, that I think would be the single best thing you could do that would, um, would, would uh, help move things forward. Thank you very much. So we go next to uh, Lawrence Lowe? Well, I think Hong Kong started with uh, parking heritage preservation under the development agenda, right? And it started to work, and I presume it's, it is still in place. So primarily, it's I don't know how strong the conservation lobby has developed since, you know, the early days, but since it's already parked under planning, I think the idea of cultural landscapes and other intangible parts of landscapes should therefore be legislated, right? As something that should be identified and then subsequently protected. And as you go along, develop a, a system where you include, for example, things that prevent uh, development doing what they've done in terms of the Korean example, right? And I know, for example, in my, my town, Georgetown, all the visual connections to the hill, which I showed you, have literally been blocked by high rises. And in fact, you, I had a slide which actually showed all of that, the before and after. And that's because people are not conscious of what they, they value. So it really goes, it's tied in with the next question that you asked is what are the values, right? But in Hong Kong, you do not have to start from scratch, but 
really the, the embedding of heritage uh, legislation should be strengthened via planning law. David shared with us earlier um, uh, sort of very interesting tools related to pricing the landscape. How could this approach be um, brought to Hong Kong uh, within the existing system, whether it's the planning system or the heritage inventory system, David? Is, is that a question to me? Um, yeah, I mean, as a, as a, as a first step, um, I think it's interesting that Ben has shown us what the Hong Kong government can do with cultural landscapes. And the um, protection of the harbor ordinance is an incredibly robust uh, tool that gives a very high level of protection to what is actually a cultural asset. The, the ordinance actually calls it a natural asset, which it is, but to me, it's a, it's a primary value as a cultural asset. Um, I think what I would say is that the actions of the government, uh, although excellent in different locations, um, are not based on a comprehensive survey and understanding of the cultural landscape across Hong Kong. And I think as a first step, I think um, to identify what we have and then to ask professionals and ordinary people what they value about it. That's the first step um, to meaningful action, I think. Um, I would entirely endorse what Ken has just suggested. I think legislation would be great, um, but legislation is going to be lengthy and controversial. We, as Ken mentioned, we already have a very uh, tool in place uh, in the administrative system, that is the conservation area zoning. As Ken also mentioned, it's an entirely, I mean, almost entirely rural uh, classification based on natural heritage, not on cultural heritage. Now that, that could easily be extended without creating new layers of our planning system, new ordinances. That, that could be readily extended into urban areas or village areas without great um, great need for change to our system. So, so picking up on, on David's point and, and uh, the point that I interrupted Fredo earlier, uh, perhaps the audience joining us today in the room uh, from the perspective of getting diverse perspectives um, from various uh, walks of life and various disciplines, if you could type into the, the Zoom chat uh, your um, uh, one or two suggestions for what you think is uh, an important cultural landscape in Hong Kong, worthy of protection, will get a sense of um, the range of things that you find of concern and of value. And so, um, and now I, while, while we wait for people's comments to come in, we now circle back to Mr. Ben Lo, I think in a way who has ultimately the final say in these things in moving this conversation forward. We've heard from the various um, panelists just now um, you know, various suggestions from um, strengthening understanding to strengthening planning laws to, uh, you know, um, highlighting the notion of conservation area as a planning tool um, that extends not just to, to nature, but also to culture, whether it's an urban or, or, or a rural setting, and of course, legislation as well. Um, but starting, first of all, with really an in inventory of what the landscape assets of Hong Kong are as such. I wonder if you could pick up on some of these points and, and, and suggest ways of moving forward or things that perhaps your, your office is already planning to do in this regard. Uh, thank you. I think I echo with um, Michael's suggestion that we have um, quite a number of tools or and we can put all these together. And I think the most important thing we need is a policy to do this. Back in the 2007, 2008, the government uh, launched a policy on built heritage conservation, which mainly focused on built heritage. So mainly focused on the buildings, the structures, how to preserve it, how to revitalize it. And up till now, I can say the scheme is quite uh, successful, though there is a number of uh, projects uh, withdrawn. But the overall um, result and the performance, I, I, I think is uh, quite successful. So if we can formulate a policy for cultural landscape, which actually, and to be honest, not many people know uh, what exactly is cultural landscape. If you talk about built heritage, it's easy, there is a building. But of course, after this uh, symposium, I think uh, many of us 
we have a better understanding of cultural landscape, but there are still many people uh, in Hong Kong or within the government there, they don't have such concept. So firstly, I think we need to um, bring in some elements so what is cultural landscape? And then the next step will be to formulate a policy such that when there is a policy, then uh, there, is, there must be some um, implementation tools. To it. In your opinion, what would this policy possibly cover? Because we we know that actually, you know, uh, while while from a maybe in, inside perspective, there's a bit of um, a concern that you know um, these issues are not well articulated yet in Hong Kong. From an outside perspective, you know, people have been following, like for for us us here in UNESCO, we've been following uh, lots of developments in Hong Kong, including. Um, uh, when uh, Carrie Lam announced a few years ago, sort of a, a big government push to protect countryside, um, countryside areas um, and uh, projects to uh, fund uh, various rural conservation areas. I think in a sense, these are actually quite ahead of the game um, in an Asian context. There are not that many Asian uh, countries that are you know, um, specifically identifying the need to protect things like rural, essentially landscapes, whether they're built or they're, they're natural or both. And so um, it, it seems that there are already quite a number of policy elements um, scattered um, in, in different aspects of, of Hong Kong um, um, policy, and policy. But I wonder if uh, Mr. Lowe could um, elaborate a bit more, uh, maybe some of the key points uh, of what policy might contain. Uh, I think the key point I, I have already mentioned is the understanding of cultural landscape. So uh, if the people, they don't understand what is it, then they cannot uh, formulate such the policy. So uh, basically in Hong Kong, I think, um, for example, if you are thinking of using some um, conservation song to protect some uh, cultural landscape, I think it's not always can work within the urban city. Maybe we can have some um, ex good examples as mentioned by Ken, it's the Maipo area, which is a quite rural area, which we can actually uh, have some ordinance and policies to protect it. But if you, we are back to the urban area, then this is quite difficult. So firstly, I think um, we uh, need to have a better understanding for more people about cultural landscape. And then uh, let's see how we can formulate a policy to protect the cultural landscape. And I think uh, Michael has already rightly pointed out that we have many, many tools and um, implementation plans that we can use, but we need to see how we can pull it all together. So maybe in one umbrella. So that's the, um, the implementation process can be, more smooth. One of the challenges, of course, and, and if we take a, um, a cue from the UNESCO concept of the historic urban landscape, um, the historic urban landscape recommendation for 2010 um, emphasizes the necessity to include all the layers that are components of a landscape. So beyond uh -huh. the, the so monuments that are mm -hmm. recognized as uh, built heritage. Uh, there is also, you know, vernacular um, buildings, um, sort of ordinary buildings. But then there is also environmental components, whether it's the geographical features or it's hydrological features and so forth. And then finally, there's a social component in terms of, you know, people and how they make their life um, in these landscapes. So the historic urban landscape concept says that, you know, as a starting point, all of these different layers need to be um, uh, identified and mapped. Uh, now, in, in reality, we know that, um, 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 of course, uh, government institutions are set up in, in silos, and so information um, is um, is uh, collected and then mapped and then held by different organizations. Um, perhaps uh, David or Ken could comment in the context of Hong Kong, what would be a mechanism to bring together these different strands of information just so we can have a kind of robust and uh, multi-dimensional component uh, and understanding of what the landscape is. No, 
uh, the landscape ar architecture profession in Hong Kong has for some years been pressing for a department of landscape. Uh, at the moment, landscape is a, um, amongst other things, a subset of the architectural services department. So if you brought, uh, if you had a department that was responsible for landscape, that would, the, 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 the cultural landscape would fall within that ambit. Could, could I um, say something? Uh, the, I, I, the conservation area has been mentioned um, once or twice, and I, it's a tool which I think is um, sadly underused. I mean, we've had the concept of conservation areas in um, the UK for quite a long time now, but they're really very neglected as a tool for um, controlling what happens in special areas. Um, <clears throat> I remember talking to um, Carrie Lam, it would be probably 10, 10 or more years ago now, about the, um, the idea of a conservation area stretching from um, uh, Hong Kong Park um, through the area with uh, the Central Government offices and um, the um, right across to, um, to Daigun. Daigun and, um, uh, the, the you know having an area where you actually specifically said that no development um, should take place here without special consideration, and um, she was fairly appalled by the idea that um, you know conservation should uh, have that degree of control over the right to do what you wanted with your own land. The same sort of thing applies in um, in the UK. You know it's not. Um, it's not something which is used nearly as much as it could be. And I think the idea of um, conservation um, areas as a, a management tool, as something which is taken very seriously, would be a real step forwards in helping control both the urban cultural landscapes and, and in, the, um, in the wider um, landscape context as well. So now we're, we're, we're touching upon maybe the second round of questions, which is looking at policy tools and so forth in order to manage or protect mm -hmm. cultural landscapes. Uh, we've heard from Michael Morrison from the UK. Now, I wonder if um, Lawrence could share, you talked earlier about the importance of strengthening planning uh, regulations and tools. In Georgetown, you have, of course, the special area plan for the World Heritage Site, and it uses a system of overlays. Um, various layers of overlays to control various things uh, related to conservation. I wonder if you could share how well or not well that has worked and whether that's a consideration for Hong Kong, um, whether um, the overlays in, in planning um, um, in a special plan, area plan could work. Well, well, I mean, in Penang, I showed you two examples of very large areas that have been gazetted uh, in terms of UNESCO and then that then the planning department having to really create them as special area plans. Um, one was Georgetown and the other one was the biosphere, which if you look at the area, it's huge, you know, uh, thousands of hectares. I think it's a com using a combination of tools to eventually look at over layering it in, in an oral concept. So some, it has to start somewhere and maybe it doesn't necessarily need to be a government agency per se, it could back it or, or kickstart it, but there is a possibility that it doesn't have to be one plan, one policy that uh, covers everything, but really a variety of policies which, which will work better, right? And that is what I really, in my mind, is trying to show in what I presented. Now, we are also working on trying to prove in a way, whether the historic urban landscape can really be applied to major towns and cities, secondary cities and towns. And in fact, we just have embarked on a pilot study to do that. So if, if that works, and that actually allows us to dovetail it into something that is quite critical to the people and communities, um, I think the government will sit up and look at it. What we have done in Malaysia now is we have started what we call culture-based local economic development. So we have gone to secondary cities and towns where we have actually offered uh, grants to kickstart 
these culture-based projects. Obviously, it's as you say, it's a, it's a pilot and how far it go depends on the backing of the government itself. But we we decided that if it's not linked to development and making culture as part of development, nobody's going to sit up and listen to you. That would that would be partially an answer to what we are doing in Penang and the surrounding areas. So if we take this approach um, and, and we go back maybe to Ken, uh, you were saying uh, one, one way to move forward would be to, to, to try to do this work, apply the new planning possibilities, uh, do the inventory and so forth for a particular site in Hong Kong. Uh, between uh, David and Ken on stage, I wonder if you have a, a recommendation for a site that would lend itself to this, a site that's both high value uh, as well as high risk or is under threat um, and, and would be a good illustration of how this would work. Maybe one rural and one, one, one urban site, and we can go back to uh, the powers that be and see if they are still as appalled as the reaction that Michael got when he you know, mooted the idea of a conservation area. Um, I haven't heard of um, any of uh, some solid um, definition or interpretation of government here, like um, Conservant Central, they have a clear, very clear initiative and policy to preserve the uh, eight items. But for Government Hill, I think there is no such a um, interpretation terms for it. So individual building is being protected, just like Ken said, um, that like the government house is a declared monument and uh, the former French mission building and the uh, former central government office has already been turned into the legal hub. So it's now occupied by the um, DOJ, the Department of Just Justice. So I think um, uh, individual um, structures or building is being protected, but there is a no uh, uh, concept of what is um, to be done for, for the government view. I wonder if uh, David and or Ken or Mr. Ben Lowe have um, any uh, suggestions for uh, an interesting but challenging uh, rural site um, that would merit being a pilot. I, I, I would say some of the feng shui landscapes that we have, um, feng shui landscapes are fascinating because they're a combination of man living in very close harmony with na natural features. So you have all the cultural landscape components of natural features and then human influenced features uh, and then built features. Um, I think you could choose a number. Um, Lai Chi War is the one that springs immediately to mind where the government is doing some excellent work in terms of rural economy and conservation. It's a really multi-pronged um, uh, program working in, in close, uh, close proximity with um, NGOs. Um, what, what is interesting is, is that if you look at some of the rural outline, uh, outline zoning plans, OZPs as we call them, um, in village zones, planning department is doing some very interesting things um, using unconventional conservation methods. So I know at least one in, in um, Big Wave Bay in Sai Kung, in the V zone, um, generally in Hong Kong, demolition is a permitted activity without permission. But um, within, in that OZP, uh, the village houses actually cannot be demolished without uh, permission, which is a really interesting use of a, a planning tool in a rural context. So that's uh, really a uh, restriction. And, and it's really, a, I suppose you could say, an area-based conservation. If, if you take into account that the village is surrounded by triple SIs and I think conservation areas, there's a, there's a really quite powerful sort of area-based conservation initiative going on there. Uh, but I would say Feng Shui villages. So once again, we hand the floor back to Ben Lowe to, to wrap up from, from this section, whether it's in terms of elaborating uh, further aspects of the policy that you suggested from either a rural perspective or an urban perspective, um, or it's uh, ways of um, maybe putting into place some of this maybe pilot-based initiatives. What would you say would be some of the, the key things moving forward in terms of um, uh, 
uh, protection uh, for um, cultural landscapes in Hong Kong? Mm. What I can say um, is that there, actually in Hong Kong, there are already quite a number of management tools that we can make use of in protecting the cultural landscape. Uh, we use different tools in different areas. For example, the MIPO area is a very significant and then we adopt a more stringent approach by using legislation. And for Thai O, I don't, I can't say it's not significant, but uh, we use other tools like uh, form formulation of policies. So in the Hong Kong government now, um, there is a policy that's the, for the Lantau Island, we only develop the Lofton part. So the southern part is preserved for the uh, leisure and leisure activities. So this policy is very clear that we have already protected the uh, um, South Land Town, like the Tai O area. And also um, one thing I also need to mention, and uh, Professor Lawrence has also mentioned that, is the climate change. So this is a and hot topic now, but this is actually it poses a threat on some of the uh, cultural landscape, like the case um, Professor Lawrence say in uh, Penang. So they have to control the flooding. Similarly, in Thai O, we need to control the flooding because there are several cases that when the typhoon signal, uh, when typhoon comes the tidal is very high and that uh, all the uh, seawater flush into the state house. So it may um, pose a threat to the state house. Also, the, uh, there are other, other issues we need to take care of is the, the maintenance of this state house because um, when, if it is not properly maintained, it may collapse one day. So these are all we can do to protect our cultural landscape. I think it will come up again um, in the questions, um, but I think one of the things we can discuss as we go forward is, is also the issue of incentives. Um, um, Lawrence was mentioning earlier the importance of um, incorporating a development perspective in terms of improvement of well-being, you know, for, for local people into um, um, whatever policy or, or initiatives um, that are trying to protect landscapes. So with that, I'd like to thank the panel uh, for your uh, contributions and uh, invite you to stay on stage because we have a number of audience um, questions from the audience, uh, both um, through Zoom and, and from the floor. So I'd like to turn over to Fredo uh, to uh, start with a question uh, from, from the room. Sure. Thank you, Montira. So uh, opening the floor up to the first question. So uh, Sandy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank, first of all, Hong Kong Icon for organizing this symposium. Um, I think it's the first one on this topic that, that uh, I've ever been aware of anyway. Uh, it's long overdue. So thank you very much. And thank you very much to the panelists for your very erudite presentations. I wanted to follow up on the on the tools, the issue of the tools of how we achieve uh, recognition and uh, preservation, conservation of, of uh, cultural landscapes. Do we have all the tools in place already? Is it more of just of a mindset? And I wanted to ask a specific question about the, because I'm not familiar enough with it, the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance. Is there something within that ordinance that prevents the identification of areas? Because as David mentioned in his presentation, uh, you look at point, line, and, and plane, or, or area. But at the moment in Hong Kong, we are only identifying points, as Kenneth uh, 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 illustrated. So why is that? Is there something in the AMO that prevents the identification of areas, or is it just a mindset and that the AMO would allow that? So maybe uh, this is a question to all three of you sitting there here. Thank you. I'm not familiar enough with the ordinance, so I'll defer to these gentlemen. 
thank you for the questions. I think um, you're rightly point out that un now under the Antiquities and Monument Ordinance, um, we look after two, two areas. So one is the um, historic building, the declared monument, so it's uh, individual. And the other thing we look at is the archaeology, so the relax. So um, for the AMO itself, I think it's, um, they're more concentrated on um, built heritage conservation. Uh, so for other uh, tools that I mentioned or uh, Ken and David mentioned, they are more on the planning planning tools. So it's on the um, zoning, uh, the planning applications. And um, if you uh, say like um, if some area is zoned um, under different zoning, then if you need to have some development, then you need to apply uh, to the time planning board. So that's the, uh, the other ways we can, we can do now. In, in, in other countries uh, where they've recently updated or overhauled their heritage legislation, there are a number of countries that are now explicitly putting in the words cultural landscape, you know, or urban landscape or so forth um, around Asia, uh, precisely to provide the umbrella uh, by which, you know, there's a legislative um, basis by which such things could be protected. But in reality, translating, you know, the one or two mentions of the word cultural landscape in say a national heritage law into then the planning ordinances and the zoning regulations and whatnot, that's quite a far, you know, a long road ahead because, you know, as exactly as Ken says, you know, the urban planners will say, well, we don't know anything about heritage. So, you know, someone's got to tell us, you know, which bits have to be zoned what, so. So, but at least there is sort of, you know, you have the legal recourse to be able to point to an article in a heritage law. And I think, I mean, we, in, in the UK, we, we have in theory all the legislation in place to, to, to deal with this. But I think in reality, there's a big sort of gulf between uh, the way that natural landscape is, is protected through things like the um, areas of outstanding natural beauty and the national parks and the way that um, uh, built uh, landscapes on buildings, uh, heritage buildings in particular are conserved and, and actually trying to get the two to come together to talk about cultural landscapes um, as, a, as a concept is really very difficult and it, it, it doesn't work as well as it should. And that's why you know, I would press for trying to bring um, the control of, of um, these things under a sort of single body, a single heading, as opposed to, you know, at the moment it seems to be split between the two as far as we're concerned. And I suspect that's more or less the same in, um, in Hong Kong as well from what's being said. Okay, so um, let's move on to another question from the audience. I know we take one more. Hi, uh, my name is Katie Law, and uh, I'm a member of a, a concern group called the Government Hill Concern Group. So, in fact, I want to follow up on the um, issue of Government Hill, because just a few years ago, about two to three years ago, my group uh, actually put in a town planning application to um, try and designate um, Government Hill together with Bishop Hill, which is next to it, as a, a special uh, conservation area. And uh, that has actually a, a proper um, town planning application and uh, being discussed in the town planning board. So what we asked for is to have uh, better um, planning controls in this very, very historic area, as um, Ken said, and, uh, and, and also a very central historic part of Hong Kong. And um, I think the, the, the good thing about it is because most of the, the, the entire area actually, uh, except Bishop Hill maybe a, a little bit, you know, under the uh, 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 Hui, but the entire area is actually under the government and there's no really problem, you know, with uh, commercial interests, et cetera. And, uh, and we, we did it because um, a few years ago, of course, 
people remember that there are proposal to redevelop the West Wing to turn it into a commercial high rise. And there's also a recent proposal to build a 28 story hospital on Bishop Hill. So these are real threats. And uh, the concern group did you know, try our best to, um, to, to advocate for the, the preservation of the entire government hill. But unfortunately, I think we have to choose. I mean, um, most of our speakers said we have to choose. And in fact, we can designate that area as a, for example, a special design area. There's something in, in the, the town planning, you know, uh, ordinance. And we, we can also call it like a, you know, a heritage area. So we, we have to choose. But unfortunately, when, when we, you know, come into discussion with the government, you know, the government showed a real reluctance to do it. And that is something that I, I really feel very, very disappointed because I think if you ask for a pilot case in Hong Kong, Government Hill or together with Bishop Hill is definitely the first one that the government should do. And, uh, and they can do it, really, could, you know, could be quite successful in doing it. So I guess um, aside from the tools, availability of tools, I think the government determination and the commitment to do you know, a better you know, conservation for Hong Kong's heritage is what we are calling for today. And although you know, the, the West Wing finally uh, is not demolished and is now conserved as the um, justice hub, right? What we um, advocate for the opening of the entire compound. I mean, the open space in between the East Wing and the Main Wing for a public um, garden and also for accessibility by the public through the West Wing to, to that you know, um, beautiful uh, uh, tree there and the garden has not been uh, realized until now. So, um, I think there have been lots of efforts in the civil society uh, in the last 10 years or so in calling for you know, more accountability of the government, more commitment to um, conserve our heritage. But so far, we, we haven't seen you know, a lot of progress. And I'm hoping that through um, our discussion today, it could be a, a, a reminder to the government that in fact, they have the tools. In fact, you know, the, the legislation doesn't prohibit them to do, to, to preserve a cons conservation area, but really are they, you know, doing what they should do here to preserve our heritage? I, I think that's, that's, sorry, I talked too long, but uh, uh, I think there needs to be some determination and, right, put it into action and not just, you know, talk, talk, just talking. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Katie. The question about who is um, uh, implementing the World Heritage Convention um, sort of in Hong Kong. Um, as you say, one of the obligations of, of um, the government is to uh, draw up inventories of things that could possibly be a World Heritage Caliber. Uh, it's not definitive, so there's still quite a bit of wiggle room. But that said, I, I'm not sure if um, there has been an effort in Hong Kong to um, put forward any possible tentative list sites to join the national list, um, which is of course held um, um, uh, by Beijing. And so that might be consideration when, when, when that, that uh, kind of list making process goes about, if some of these items could in fact be cultural landscapes, whether rural or, or urban, that might you know, spark um, a bit of dialogue around that issue. Uh, I think to reprise Katie's question, I think the government is very determined and committed to do heritage conservation in Hong Kong because uh, we have a policy set up in 2008. Um, we have some initiative like the revitalization scheme I've mentioned, and also we have some uh, policy in working with private uh, historic building owners to give them some uh, incentive to preserve their place 
historic building. I think for individual case, there may be uh, individual reasons why um, why some initiative or some something is not put into action. Uh, I, the government has a very fraught discussion with the uh, uh, Hui about the project. So one is one of the conserving is one of the projects under the conserving central. Um, for the former central government office, the case uh, you mentioned, I have no first-hand information. So I promise to get back to you uh, in office about the opening of that area. Okay, so um, on that note, um, we have to conclude um, the symposium. And so uh, may I invite uh, Mr. Brian Anderson, president of HK Icon, to give a closing remark. So over to you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fredo. Thank you very much, um, everybody, uh, for uh, joining us today, um, both all of you uh, online as well as those uh, in the room and, of course, our, our distinguished guests. Um, I think what comes across to me loud and clear um, uh, from all of this is that culture is not something that is in any way uh, set apart uh, as it uh, once was, um, but it's something that surrounds us all the time, everywhere. Um, and um, it's a, a, a very good way of thinking about um, culture as a landscape uh, rather than as individual heritage assets as we've tended to do uh, in the recent past. Um, so I think it's been an extremely uh, valuable uh, discussion. Um, and uh, as time is short, I'd just like to uh, thank our speakers, Ben, Lawrence, David, Michael, and Ken. Also our moderator, uh, Montera, uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, Tai Gun for uh, hosting this event, uh, and indeed all my colleagues at HKI Icon, particularly Fredo, uh, Mung, and all the team. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you. Of course, you know, we have to also have to thank our supporting organizations, the American Institute of Hong Kong, uh, American Institute of Architects, Hong Kong chapter, and also the Hong Kong Institute of Landscape Architects. HKILA, and of course, CASH and the Professional Green Building Council. So thank you all for your support.